You can take your Bibles now and turn to the book of John, chapter 14, as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse exposition in the book of John. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, the setting is this. This is the setting of this book. So, from here until the end of chapter 20 is one night. It is the night of Jesus' betrayal. And so, uh, John takes a lot of time to go into the uh, Last Supper, and that's the setting here. Um, and in chapter 13, uh, we found out that uh, Judas Iscariot is about to betray Jesus, and he's actually already gone out of the room uh, to betray him. And now the disciples know uh, that the traitor is at work. Um, and so the disciples are confused, and they're, they're deeply troubled. And so Jesus responds to their trouble. He, he responds to their anxiety with a perfect response. And in the midst of this response, we have yet another of the seven I am statements that Jesus makes. Uh, in, this, in this case, uh, he, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so Jesus, uh, Jesus speaks in a way that rises above all the prophets of old, um, as is his right as the Son of God. Uh, in other words, Moses gave the truth. Jesus is the truth. John the Baptist, along with all preachers before, uh, before and after him, pointed the way to God. Jesus himself is the way. Uh, wisdom, the Proverbs tell us, leads to life, but Jesus is the life. So Moses gave the manna, but Jesus is the bread of life. And this is how he speaks. And so in the midst of deep trouble and confusion... Jesus' solution is to point them to himself. And he, he, he anchors us uh, in our trouble to that which is stable and steadfast when all around gives way. Not only are we anchored, but we are also uh, elevated and encouraged and assured that it is well with our souls. So when we see this, this passage, it's like our tossed and troubled lives are like the sea to which Jesus says, peace be still. Hear the word of the living God. John chapter 14, just the first six verses, Jesus says this, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you, may be, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Amen. This is the word of God. The grass withers and the flower thereof falls away, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Father, now help us by your spirit to attend to the perfect, inspired, and inerrant word of the living God. We pray, O oh God, as the scriptures teach, that your spirit would remove the veil from our eyes and hearts, that we might see wonderful things in your word. We pray, O oh God, that if anyone has an ear to hear, he would hear what the spirit says to the churches. And we pray, O oh God, that if there are those who do not have ears, spiritual ears, or spiritual eyes, that today would be the day of their salvation, that you would open their eyes, that you would unstop their ears, uh, as you have done with us, so you would do with them. Because, Lord, we need your Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The first thing I want you to see in verse 1, chapter 14, verse 1, is that Jesus commands us to be comforted in our troubles. If you want to know what the human heart sounds like, you've got an illustration. We never grow out of it. We just learn to control it a little bit. That's all. So, uh, but I want you to see this is a command, not a suggestion. Uh, Christians are those whose faith has overcome the world. This is how the Bible describes our faith. It says in, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And he says, this is the victory that, that has overcome the world, our faith. Now, faith is not imagination. You have to understand that. It's not just wishful thinking. It is 
the substance of what we believe about Christ and about his promises and his works. But by looking to Christ and by setting our eyes upon Christ, we are able to overcome the world in a way that the unbeliever cannot. Uh, we, are, we, we are able to have our feet untangled from the concerns of this world and to truly trust the Lord. All the promises in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 are for those who overcome. There is this phrase in Greek that, that occurs seven times um, in those passages, once to each of the seven churches, um, and it is Hanikon, the one who overcomes. Uh, it, it is to these who overcome that the promises are made. So we are, we are not, as Christians, uh, to be, um, we're, we, you know, we're not given a spirit of fear, we're given a, a spirit of power and boldness and of a sound mind. And we are to be those who really believe uh, what Christ has promised us. We are to remember that the world is passing away. We're to remember that our lives are a vapor. And we're to remember the, the promises of Christ and the work of Christ. And we are to be settled in our heart. The solution to trouble in this world, according to Jesus, is to look to Jesus, who himself has overcome the world. John chapter 16, verse 33, we'll get to it probably in a few weeks. He says, I have, he says, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. I'm glad he promised us that because I've had some tribulation. You probably have too. Some of you are going through tribulation and trials right now. I'm glad that Jesus didn't say, you have no trouble in this life. Because that would be so incongruent with our experience. But instead, he, he spoke uh, clearly and plainly and truthfully to us, in this life you will have tribulation. So what do we do with that? He tells us, but take heart. I have overcome the world. In this world you have tribulation, but take heart. Look to me, I have overcome the world. This is also a merciful command. So he doesn't just command, he also uh, mercifully uh, uh, gives us reasons. Now, if you've got a child or children and you tell them to do something, as a parent, you do not have to supply reasons. And I know that's tough news for children. It was tough for me to hear when I was growing up. Sometimes you just don't have time. Sometimes it's get out from the road. You know, there's a, you know, get out from the road. You don't have time to say, because if you stay there, that truck is going to hit you. Just, just leave the road, and that's a command, and the child should not be saying, well, I, don't, I, I think I need a reason for that. They should just obey. Um, but as a parent, it's also not wrong to give an explanation. You know, when a, when a parent says, eat your green beans, and the child might not like that, you don't have to tell them why they have to eat their green beans, but you can if you want to. And sometimes it helps, you know, if you don't eat your vegetables, you'll have diminished health, you'll be lethargic, you won't be happy, um, you'll, 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 you'll be sad, you'll have a shorter life, you'll have all kinds of problems. If you want to do that as a parent, that's a, that's a good thing to do, it's merciful. You don't have to, but you do. Jesus, likewise, as our king, does not have to give us reasons for his commands. It is enough that he commands and we obey. Trust and obey, the song says, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey, and that's true. There are things, there are commands that he doesn't give reasons for. But in his mercy here, he actually gives reasons for us not to be troubled. And that, that's good. And I want to talk about those reasons. The reasons in this text that he gives for our hearts to not be troubled, first of all, uh, he points to the Father's house. He says there is a heavenly reward. So notice what he's doing. We, we tend to look around on the mundane level, but he's saying, set your eyes on things above. Lift your eyes up. Think about the future, the, the, the certainty of the future. He says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would, have not, I would not have told you. And he says, I go to prepare a place for you. So he's calling the disciples to think about the heavenly reward that their Father has for them. And he's calling them to focus on that in the midst of deep trouble because they know he's about to die. The one that they love above all else is about to die. And, and I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, this is an essential to our faith. Not just that we believe in God, the demons believe in God, but that we love God and that we believe in the goodness of his character. I'm not making that up. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says this. It says, without faith it is impossible to please God. 
It says, for whoever would draw near to God must believe, and then it says two things, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. God is a rewarder. He does not promise reward on this earth in the sense of health, wealth, and prosperity. That's a false message. But he does promise reward in glory, no matter what happens on this earth. And this is what Jesus is calling them to think about. He, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And then he immediately begins to speak about this glorious estate, this huge mansion that belongs to God, their Father. Now, now God, I want you to think about this for just a minute. God is the one who fills heaven and earth. Jeremiah 23, 24, God says to, to Jeremiah, do I not fill heaven and earth? He is omnipresent. There's this new idea that God is not omnipresent in, in some of the more liberal circles of so-called Christianity. God is everywhere present. There is no place where he is not. His spirit is infinite, unbounded. He has no limits. Um, the, the entire created uh, universe is like a little marble to him. It is he, he is so far above and beyond it. Um, he is infinite in his essence. And I could go on and on, but suffice to say, when we read about a dwelling place for God, it, it's supposed to make our minds stand in awe and wonder about what this would be like. The whole earth, so Isaiah says it this way, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. And he says, what is the house that you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? There is no way for humans to build a house for God. You know, churches are just meeting places. They're not his house. Um, you know, uh, a building is just a building. The people are the church. Uh, to, to try to build a house for God would be like trying to take a little part of his footstool. The earth is his footstool, and make a house for him. It's, it, it just doesn't work. Um, only Christ can build the house of God on earth. The house of God on earth and in heaven is the church. Jesus says so. And so when Jesus starts talking about this mansion, this house of God that is waiting for us, that is in glory... It is supposed to make us think about how immense God is and what his dwelling place would be like. And the fact that he's, he's willing to share that with us. If a house is good enough for God, then it's good enough for us. It's far better than what we deserve. It's better than the most glorious accommodations here. If you could have all the treasures of the world, Everything. If you could have all the wealth and all the pleasures and all the luxuries of the world, it would be like a little stitch in a footstool compared to the house that God is preparing for us, that Christ is preparing for us. This is why in, uh, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 2.9 it says, As it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, nor has the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So I want you right now in your mind to just renounce all the silly depictions of heaven that you see on social media. They are goofy. They are not worthy of what is the truth. Um, to, to comprehend what God has for us, you would have to comprehend God, which no man can do. We are supposed to strain our minds and, to, and to, to think about what is the best that we can possibly imagine and then to realize that it's just a little tiny minuscule portion of what actually is. Jesus calls the disciples to set their minds and hearts on that which is above. And he says, in my Father's house. Uh, he, he, he reminds us that we have to one day leave all our accommodations here. Maybe you've got a nice house, maybe you don't. It really doesn't matter. Because it's, temp it's temporal. It, it will all be gone. You cannot, as they say, take it with you. But whatever you have to leave here, you will, you will inherit something far better. You will have a place in the house of God himself. And this is what, Jesus, this is what uh, David talks about in the most beloved psalm, Psalm 23. Now, remember how he closes that. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And what? I shall dwell in the house of God 
forever. Not for a little while, but forever. People say that those in the Old Testament didn't believe in everlasting life. Well, then how is David going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever? Don't listen to people who don't know their Bibles and yet think they are intelligent. In Revelation 19.9, we read another uh, uh, um, description of this or a reference to it. It's not just going to be a house, but it's going to be a feast. The angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. God not only has an eternal dwelling prepared for us, he has eternal delights prepared for us. Heaven will not be boring. God is the one who created your heart. He is the one that created your affections, your desires. Um, he is the one who alone can satisfy you. And he has, he has saved the best things for last. Just as Jesus saved the best wine for last at the wedding feast. That is, that is to point us to the fact that heaven is going to be more enjoyable, more pleasurable, more exciting than you can possibly imagine. Because God will be there. And he is able to expand your own affections and enjoyment. But when Jesus calls them away from the, their earthly concerns and tells them to set their mind on the Father's house and the fact that he's preparing a place for them, um, it, it's, it's like he's calling them to, to uh, in their heart, leave their accommodations here on earth. And we're called to do this. If your heart is wrapped up in the things that you have, you're called to let those things go, at least in your heart, so that they won't have you. All believers are, are ultimately to see themselves like Abraham. I want you to, to hear how Hebrews uh, 11, 8-9 describes Abraham. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out. So remember, Abraham is told to leave his home, leave his father's household, and to leave and to go out to a land he doesn't know where it is. That's very similar to our journey as Christians. It says, And he went out not knowing where he was going, you can hear the disciples say, Lord, we don't know the way. We're going to get to that in a minute. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. And the Bible teaches that he went out to seek a better country, and not the earthly promised land, Hebrews teaches, but the heavenly promised land. You can hear in the Psalm uh, 45, Psalm 45, it says, Listen, daughter, look and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house. Then the king will desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Bow down to him. You can hear an echo of that theme to the church. Forget this. Forget this earthly uh, economy that we have. It is not worthy of your heart. And look to Christ and look to what Christ has for you. Jesus teaches in, in verse 3, he says, if I go, so he's going away, he says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. Jesus says, not only is there this house, and not only is there a room uh, and a place in that house for you, not only is there a place at the Father's table, but I will be there. Jesus will be in the mansion with his people. I want to tell you, heaven is not heaven without Christ. If you just want to die and, and, and go to streets of gold and gates of pearl and not see Jesus, you're not going. I just want to tell you that because Christ is not in your heart. Uh, heaven is a conduit in order to be closer to Christ, in order to be closer to a person who loves you. First great commandment is, again, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. None will make it to glory who do not love Christ. If you love Christ, you will see Christ. If you do not love the Son, the wrath of God abides on you. That's what it says. Everybody wants to live forever in, 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 you know, with eternal pleasures. There's nothing supernatural about that. 
But why do you want to go to heaven? Is it, is it to see Christ who died for you? Is it to, to, to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant? Is it to uh, feel him put his glorified hand on your shoulder and say, fear not, I am alive. I am the living one. I, I died for you and now I am alive forevermore. That's what I want. That's what I want above the mansion, above the, the glorious estate above eternal pleasures is to see Jesus, to hear Him, to walk with Him. The worldling clings to the gilded toys of dust, the, the little things that the world seeks after. You know, the newest phone, the, the, the newest musician that you just have to get to to yell and scream and worship and raise your hands and jump up and down. That's, you know, the, the possessions, the promotions, the, the accumulation of stuff that will all pass away and that five years from now will not satisfy. The new car that five years later is old. That's, that's our life, unless we know Christ. And none of those things can fill your heart. They cannot make you happy. You were created for Christ. You were created for a relationship with Him. And this is why the psalmist says, whom have I in heaven but you, and there is nothing I desire on earth but you? He says, my heart my flesh may fail, and it will. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God is your portion if you're a Christian. He's the one that will never fail you. He's the one that will never disappoint you. And Jesus is reminding his disciples to be uh, guided by his counsel. And he's, reminded, he's reminding them that afterward he will receive them to glory. He says, I will come again to receive you unto myself. This is John 14, 3, our main text. It's an echo of Psalm 73, 24. It says, you guide me with your counsel and afterward you will receive me to glory. Jesus says, I will come and I will receive you to glory. When you, when you die, and you will. And I will. Jesus will be standing there ready to receive you if you're a believer. Personally, ushering you in to your reward. And you can see in this text that he wants to be with them. He wants to be with them forever. He does not leave them except in order to prepare a place for them so that he can receive them. He says that where I am, there you may be also. John 12, 26, Jesus says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Notice that. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Not just in word, but in, in life, in action. And where I am, there my servant will be also. He says, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. In John 17, 4, this is Jesus' high priestly prayer. If you want to read the best chapter in the Bible, read John 17. I say it's the best chapter in the Bible because it's packed with theology. It's because it's the longest prayer of Jesus, and Jesus' prayers are absolutely perfect. And at the end of that prayer, this is what he prays. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. You hear that? He prays, if you believe in him, those whom, he says, I, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you've given me before uh, that you've given me because you love me before the foundation of the world it's very comforting isn't it to know that Jesus prays for you that you will be with him the father will not say no to Jesus prayer and he may say no the father may say no to our prayers sometimes he does and, so, and, and it's always good if he says no it's always part of his plan and that's okay but he will not say no to the prayers of his son because the prayers of his son are perfect. He desires that we be with him. And that is of great comfort to me. Hosea 2, 19 through 20, you can hear again an echo of this. He says, uh, God says, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you will know the Lord. The Bible teaches that the church is the bride of Christ. And why does it fashion us as the bride? Why does it compare us to the bride? It's not in your notes. Uh, but it's because Christ is the bridegroom. He's the one who dies 
for the church. He's the one who uh, sheds his blood to redeem and to protect the church, just as a husband is to protect and defend and nourish and bless his wife. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's what men are called to do. We don't do it perfectly, but that's, how we're, that's what we're called to do. But it's what Christ has done for the bride, the church. And it's also to, to make us understand the beauty of the, of the relationship and the depth of the love that the Son has for you. It's compared to the, the highest of loves, uh, which is um, marital love. Husband and wife. It's also a compare, of course, to father to children and even to mother to children at times. Jesus uh, uses these highest forms of human love as springboards for our minds so that we will think about the greater love that Christ has for us. So it's really as simple as that. Jesus wants you to be there. If you're a believer, he wants to be with you. And then he says, you know the way. <laughs> and this really confuses them. He says, where I am going, you know. And they're like, no, we don't. And he says, and you know the way. That's verse 4. And so he's telling them right off the bat that they, they, they don't need to doubt their inheritance. Um, the, the way is open to them. And they already have this inheritance. Um, at least they are the legal possessors of it. Uh, Romans chapter 8, 16 through 17, it says this, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Do you have that witness of the Spirit? I hope you do if you're a believer. Do you have that witness of the Spirit that says, you, I belong to Him. I belong to Him. It says, If we are children, then we are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. In 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 21 and 22, it says, All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or, or the present or the future, all are yours. Everything is deeded to the believer through Christ. The new heavens and the new earth are yours. Uh, uh, Peter writes about our inheritance. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 3 through 5, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance. So notice Jesus is talking about this mansion. Peter talks about this inheritance. He says to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That's different than everything that we have on earth. Everything we have on earth is perishable. It fades and it is defiled. There's no perfect thing on earth. Uh, everything that we have fades. But the contrast to that is the eternal inheritance that we have in glory. And it's already ours. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And so they say, you know, we don't know the way. We don't know the way. Lord, we don't know where you're going. Verse 5, how can we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Ego e me te hodos. I am the way or the road. And when he says ego e me, just as, as you already know, I'm sure, but that is a claim to deity. Those, those words, I am. When he says, I am, and then he follows it. It, it goes back to Exodus 3. When Moses saw the burning bush. And he asks God, what is your name? I have to be able to tell them who sent me. What is your name? And God said, I am. Tell them I am. Meaning I exist. It's not I was or I will be. It's I am. It is, a, it is an infinitive. It is a state of existence. God alone has existence, self-existence. Everything else is derived from him. Everything else has contingent existence. But God alone has self-existence. And when Jesus says, I am, that's what he's claiming. He's claiming to be fully God. The second person of the Trinity, of course. Turn to 
Turn with me to John chapter uh, 8, verse 58, if you will, if you've got your Bibles open. We've already been in this text many, many months ago, as we've gone verse by verse, but, but this is an interesting passage of Scripture I just want to mention briefly. Well, I want to mention it at length, but I can't. Jesus is speaking to the Jews and he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. And the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? So you understand Abraham died thousands of years before Christ. Well, the earth. Jesus answered. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I was. Now he doesn't say that. That would be saying that he was simply alive before Abraham. And maybe we would say, he, well, like the Jehovah's Witnesses say, maybe he was the first created being. That's not what he says, though. He says, before Abraham was, I am. He, he says the same thing that God says in the burning bush. I am. And so what's their response to this? They know what he's saying. Their response is to pick up stones to throw at him. They want to kill him. And later they will say, we do not stone you for a good work, but for claiming to be God, making yourself equal to God. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three distinct persons. Jesus says, I am. And I had to, I had to say that. I know that's not in your notes, but I had, to, I had to point out that claim to deity. But here he is saying that he is the way, the road to eternal glory. And I want you to see in verse 6, this is what we're going to talk about for the rest of the time. Verse 6. The context of this quote is encouragement. The disciples are bewildered, and Jesus is encouraging them. Uh, we, we, we usually use this as a polemic, as a, as a contradiction to false doctrine when people say there are many ways to Christ. We're going to talk about that. But I want you to see the original context is encouragement. They're bewildered. They're afraid. Jesus is leaving them. What's, what's happening? Um, Judas is betraying, them, uh, is betraying him. He's talking about dying in a few hours. And Jesus says, I'm just going away to prepare a place for you, and you know the way, and I am the way. When he says he's the way, this is not the first time he's made this claim. Have you ever heard the, the, the song Stairway to Heaven? It's uh, generally considered to be one of the best songs in uh, all uh, music. But uh, whether you like it or not, the, the concept of a stairway to heaven is actually in the Bible. In Genesis, chapter 28, verse 12, uh, the patriarch Jacob, so you've got, uh, you've got Jacob, and he is, uh, he, he is uh, running from his brother Esau, and it says this, it says, Jacob lay down, he, he put a stone under his head, and it says, Jacob dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder or stairway set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. So you've got Jacob seeing this vision. And there's more in Genesis 28 we can talk about, but suffice to say, in John chapter, chapter 1, verse 51, <laughs> Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, which is himself. So Jesus is, point, Jesus is saying, remember that vision that Jacob had? Where there's a pathway from earth to heaven. Jacob sees this vision. Jesus says, that's me. I am the way. I am the stairway to heaven, if you will. And he tells, he tells the disciples in John chapter 1, this is right after he calls them. Just, just imagine, you're, you're doing your own thing, and then suddenly a rabbi, a young rabbi, shows up, and he starts telling you he's the only way to heaven, and he's actually the true meaning of Jacob's vision. That's what Jesus claimed. Well, he's claiming the same thing here, just in different terms, when he says, I am the way, I am the road. Uh, he, he's inviting us to picture him as a road, of course, not a literal road, but as a road, as a pathway from point A to point B. As an access port. In Ephesians 2.18, it says both Jew and Gentile, through Christ we have access in one spirit to the Father. 
And so he says, believe in God, believe also in me. And I want you to notice that Jesus is the way. Your, your good works are not the way. So Jesus, not good works, is the way to the Father. Uh, this is a major difference between Christianity and just about every other religion. There's only one true religion. Uh, of course, the Bible uses that word religion in a positive and a negative sense. People say, well, it's a relationship, not a religion. It's actually both, according to the Bible. A religion has to do with uh, the rules uh, of the faith, the, the contours of the faith, the doctrine of the faith. Uh, the Bible says there is pure and undefiled religion, and then there are false religions. But all other religions are false. I hope you know that. There's only one revelation from God. He doesn't, he doesn't, how confusing would it be if he said mutually exclusive things are both true? That would be very confusing. No, he has spoken to us by his son and revealed the truth to us. And virtually every other religion has a list of things that you have to do in order to reach God. Or in order to be right with God, or in order to reach a state of nirvana. But in Christianity, it says, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is a gift from God. Christianity is the only, it's the only true religion, it's the only, it's the only faith, and I use that word loosely concerning others, where God comes down and rescues us. Everything else is us, all the others are us trying to climb the ladder to get to God. But in Christianity, God comes down in the person of Christ and pays for our sins himself and dies for us. He takes action. He takes action. He saves us. So all the works that are necessary for salvation have been finished by Christ. In John chapter 19, verse 30, when he says, it is finished, that's what he means. Some people will say, well, you know, Christ has done 50% of the work, and then you have to do 50% of the work. Or Christ has done 90% of the work, and you have to do 10% of the work. Or Christ has done 99% of the work, but you still have to do this, this, and this. It's all garbage. Christ has done 100% of the work to pay for your sins. There is nothing you can do to add to what he has done. And if you think you can add to what he has done, you're actually blaspheming. You're actually detracting from his work. You're saying his work is not good enough. I need to do something. Now, are there good works that follow from the Christian life? Absolutely. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have gone, new things have come. You have, you have a changed life. The Bible teaches that there is a changed life that happens. But none of those works give you any credit with God. They are a way for you to express your love and thankfulness to God, but they don't give you credit. There's no, there's no Christian uh, that is more saved than another. You're either born again or you're not. Your, your sins are either forgiven by Christ or you're still in your sins. There's no, there's no halfway. Jesus is not most of the way. Notice he says, I am the way, not most of the way. He is the complete way. He doesn't need us to add a few uh, planks to the bridge. One commentator says this, a bridge over a chasm that lacks one inch is no longer a bridge, but a disaster. If you've got a bridge that stretches you know, a mile, away, a mile across, but it just, it just misses that connection point by one inch. It will not sustain your car. Please don't drive over it. Okay? Christ bridges the gap between God and man. That's why he is the only way. That's why his works are finished. And he's already taught that this road is narrow in Matthew 7, 14. Don't be deceived by people that teach that there are many ways to God. Again, Jesus did not teach this. He taught, I am the way. He said that the, the way that leads to life is narrow, and only a few find it. He said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many find it. Many find the broad way. Only a few find the narrow way. And now he's saying that narrow way is actually himself. This calls believers uh, and unbelievers to repent of trusting their own ways. Do you, do you know what our culture says if you want to be happy? 
You, many of you know this. You want to be happy, follow your heart. That's what the culture says. Do you know what the Bible says about the human heart? It says the heart, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I mean, you can't even know yourself. And if you think you do know yourself, if you think you do know your heart, let's talk. Because I guarantee I can, I can rewind the clock of your life just a few years and find something that you are absolutely certain that you wanted. Whether it's a relationship or whether it's a job or a place to live or whatever. Or something you just really, really wanted and that's proven to be the wrong decision. We all do that. Our hearts are not steady guides. Our hearts are sometimes right and sometimes wrong. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean to your own understanding. Isaiah says this, he says, all, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, meaning Christ, the iniquity of us all. Proverbs 12, 15, it says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. So Jesus is telling us to stop leaning to our own understanding and to, to acknowledge him, to trust him, to trust the way that he tells us. Many people behave as though they don't need a guide. They don't need a shepherd. They'll, they'll figure it all out on their own. I talked to one man who, um, he said, I'm very religious. I said, oh, okay, I said, it's interesting. I said, uh, what do you believe? And he told me, you know, some, some something uh, that didn't really make a lot of sense. And I said, so where do you get your information? And he said, from me. He pointed to his head. I said, have you ever been wrong before? He said, well, yeah. I said, what if you're wrong about this? What if you're wrong about eternity? What if you're wrong? You know, why, why, not, why not listen to one who has been there, who left heaven, rather than just simply speculating about what you think heaven will be? You know, I'm wrong about food choices. I want to be wrong about... I'm wrong about who's going to win a football game. <laughs> Although Alabama's going to win next week. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Russell. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> well, I'd be a false prophet if that doesn't come true. Okay, that was just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, we are wrong about a lot. We ought to listen to the absolute truth, Jesus himself, who declares to us the will of God and the way of salvation, and he says it is me, meaning Christ. The Bible is very clear about this. There are not multiple ways to heaven. John, Everybody knows John 3.16. Do you know two verses later in John 3.18, almost nobody knows. He says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, and praise God for that. Whoever truly has faith in Christ is is not condemned. You will know them by their fruits. There are many who will say they believe, but they have no changed life. They are not speaking the truth according to the Bible. If anyone says, I know him and does not keep his commandments, he is a liar. John, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. He has neither seen him nor known him. But if anyone, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's what it says. I can't make that scripture go away. It's there. It was written by the Holy Spirit himself. Whoever does not believe is already condemned. All humanity that does not believe the gospel is already condemned. That's what Jesus himself taught. Now he's either right or he's wrong. You can't, you know, people say, oh, well, Jesus is a good teacher. I think Jesus is a good teacher, but I don't believe some of those things that he said. You know, when he talks about everlasting punishment or when he talks about the exclusivity of the faith. If he's wrong about those, he's a terrible teacher. But he's not wrong. He's right. He has declared the way of salvation. John chapter 3, same chapter as John three sixteen. Again, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains upon him. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, we know that we are from God, says John the Apostle, and the whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. If you, if you wonder about other religions, the Bible is abundantly clear. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other name. People will say, well, I think you can 
know God without believing in Christ. Not according to Christ. 1 Timothy 2, 5. And there are dozens and dozens of these texts. Dozens and dozens of these texts. There is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. Only one. There is only one. There is only one way. He says, I am the way. He says, I am the truth and the life. And just very quickly, I want to talk about, uh, about these. Um, Jesus says he is the truth. Now, today, where there's an assault on absolute truth in our society, you, you know it as postmodernism. It's just a satanic assault on absolute truth. And it appeals to the sinful, arrogant nature of man. We are sinful and arrogant by nature. It's what, it's what Satan did to Eve in the garden when he, he, he presented an alternative to Eve. The day that you eat it, you will not surely die. God knows that when you eat it, you'll be like him. You'll be like God's. Well, they ate it, and they, 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 mankind has been spiritually dead ever since. The Bible teaches in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, Malachi 3, 6, it says, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. This assault today in our culture on absolute truth is an assault on God. It is a direct assault on God. Because you, you, you cannot, if you don't believe in absolute truth, then you can't believe that Christ is absolutely true. You know, if I believe that this is a door, this is not a wall to me, it's a door. And I try to walk through it, I'm going to have a bad day. Why? Because this is, this is here. It's absolutely here. And it doesn't matter whether you believe it's here or not, it's here. This is the nature of reality. And so when, when people say, you know, well, you know, I, I don't believe I'm a boy, or I don't believe I'm a girl, or I don't believe I'm a human, now I'm a cat or whatever. Um, you know, it doesn't work. You know, the, 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 um, the Roadrunner, if you've ever seen the old Looney Tunes, the Roadrunner was a postmodernist. I don't know if you, if you realize that. There's a, there's a wall, there's a wall there, and he draws a, a door on it. Or the coyote rather draws a door on it. And the Roadrunner runs straight through it. But the coyote tries that. He thinks, well, this is a this is a, a, a tunnel to me. It's not a, it's not a wall to me. It's a tunnel to me. And he tries to go through it, knowing that he just painted it there and runs straight into it. <coughs> and yet today we have people saying, "Well, I'm just going to live my truth." You know, you know what's interesting to me? Nobody lives their truth when it comes to hiring an engineer to check out the blueprints for the house they're going to live in. Nobody, nobody hires a builder that says, you know, I don't really get into math. Math is only true for some people, and I'm living my truth, so let me build your house. <laughs> What's more important, a house or a human? So we're going we're gonna to be relativistic about people, but not about houses, construction, stop signs? You know, God has made a rational, logical, consistent universe. One, one of the assumptions that every scientist makes is that the universe is uniform, that the scientific laws that happen here are also happening in the farthest reaches of, of the universe. Uh, gravity still functions on the other side of the universe. And if they don't make that assumption, science doesn't work. They have to assume uniformity. They can't assume relativity. They can't, they can't assume postmodernism. And whether people like it or not, God's word is true. It's not an option. It's not, a, uh, it's, it's not true if it's true for you. It's true, period. It is the truth. And so scripture teaches that everyone who rejects Jesus as the only way is seen by God as antichrist. Or an antichrist. First John chapter two verse twenty two. Who, who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. 
Paul says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a, a, another gospel other than the one that we preached, let him be accursed. He says, as we have said before, now we say again, if anyone's preaching to you another gospel, let him be accursed. And yet what do we see in a lot of liberal churches today. They'll say things like, well, the Bible, it's a good rule book, right? It's a good book of opinions or ideas, but we don't necessarily follow it. We can change it as necessary. Or they'll say, you know, there are many ways to God. The Bible taught, uh, Jesus himself taught that this was going to happen towards the end. There would be a great falling away from the truth, a lack of standing and, and, and apostasy, which is what the word apostasy means, a failure to stand. But Jesus testifies clearly, he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And so when he says he is the life, last thing I'm going to say today, he is again claiming to have life in himself and to be the source of life. Life proceeds from the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. To us. Revelation 22 verse 1 it says. The angel showed me the river of the water of life. Bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And I got to preach that text not too long ago if you remember. But you've got God. The source of life. Uh, you've got. Uh, you notice the throne of God and the Lamb. And you've got this river of life flowing out. And supplying life to all that are in glory. Jesus is the source of life. He is, the, he is able to, to give you eternal life. As the Father raises the dead, he says in John 5, so the Son gives life to whom he will. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. You've heard it at funerals perhaps. John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die yet, he will live. There is no one else that can give eternal life but Christ. In fact, he says, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's in that same high priestly prayer. And so what do we do with this? When Jesus holds out such wonderful uh, truths about our future, um, even in the midst of our times of trouble. Uh, the the, the uh, book of Colossians tells us this in Colossians 3, 1 through 4. This will be the last scripture of the day, I believe. I hope you don't want, uh, I hope you don't want me to be unexcited about this. I'm very excited about this. <laughs> Paul says, if you have been raised with Christ, meaning spiritually raised, seek the things that are above. So notice the contrast. Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Do that this week. Take your mind and intentionally set it on things above. Where is Christ? He is above. He has ascended to glory. Set your mind upon Christ. It says, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. The living, the, the, the things of this earth can only entangle those who are still alive to them. We are dead to the world and alive to Christ. It says, when Christ who is your life, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That is of great comfort. You will appear with Christ in glory. That is a certainty if you're a believer. So the things that happen this week should not entangle your heart. You should be, and I should be thinking about, appearing with Christ in glory. And I should be setting my mind upon Christ this week, and you should too. Many hearts will be troubled, will be tested this week. And many will be troubled. But yours doesn't have to be. Regardless of what happens here in this life, where evil, evil often has a temporary victory, and there's death, confusion, and chaos all around, where the earth gives way, and where the mountains are carried into the midst of the sea, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. 
For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you, Isaiah 54, 10. So no matter what besets you this week in the mundane realm, the earthly realm, remember that your true citizenship is in heaven. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your hearts to where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Remember his love for you. And as he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Let's pray. Father, how we, how we adore the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, how we sit in awe of him. Lord, we marvel at the love of Christ who was about to be crucified and yet spent time giving the disciples words of comfort, words of promise, showing them that indeed he is the way and showing us as well that he is the way to eternal life. Lord, we thank you for this great text and for the promise of this mansion that you have waiting for your people where Christ is. And now we pray that you would help us to set our hearts and our minds on things that are above and that the things of this life would not entangle us or trouble us. For we have peace with you through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.